makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix as we continue our special coverage from the IMF World Bank annual meetings here in Marrakesh. Now, coming up on today's program, Israel's army calls for the evacuation of Gaza City within 24 hours. The UN says the order is impossible. Iran warns Israel of a multi-front war if attacks continue. Top U.S. diplomat Antony Blinken continues a whirlwind Middle East trip as Washington and Qatar agree to hold off distributing $6 billion in Iranian oil revenue. Plus, we're live from the IMF World Bank meetings here in Marrakesh with interviews including the Italian Central Bank Governor Ignazio Visco and the European President, Eurogroup President rather, Pascal Donahue. Now let's take a look at the European markets map. I have to say it was a pretty ugly, very intense day when it came to treasuries yesterday. So we look at bonds, but also equities across the board. Global equities are extending a lot of the losses. I think it's only the FTSE over in the UK and maybe part of uh, the Spanish and Portuguese indices that are not extending some of the losses. Again, treasuries gained, uh, crude oil rising as tensions are ratcheting up. Here in the Middle East, there's continued weakness also. Maybe the, the data point that was interesting after US CPI yesterday continued weakness in China's economy. And again, the prospect of these higher for longer U.S. interest rates are adding to the general gloom. Now, on to geopolitics and Israel has called for an evacuation of more than one million civilians living in northern Gaza within the next 24 hours, ahead of what looks like an imminent ground invasion. The aim here is to minimize the damage to civilians. There are significant combat operations ongoing and we are preparing for future and the continuance of our combat operations and out of an understanding that there are civilians here whom are not our enemy and we do not want to target them. We are asking them to evacuate so that we will be able to continue to strike military targets belonging to Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Oliver Cook. He's in Tel Aviv. So, Ali, what's the latest so far? So, yeah, Francine, that was the major development of the last few hours, the Israeli military calling for the evacuation of northern Gaza and Gaza City. Um, and you heard it there from the Israeli Defense Forces that they were talking about displacing, uh, you know, more than a million people, which the U.N. says is basically impossible. In a statement, the U.N. says it considers it impossible for such a movement to take place without devastating humanitarian consequences. The United Nations strongly appeals for any such order to be rescinded, avoiding what could transform what is already a tragedy into a calamitous situation. And the tragedy they're referring to, of course, is the more than 1,500 people that are dead uh, now in Gaza that we understand from the health authorities there, health authorities that are completely overwhelmed with infrastructure that has completely collapsed, whether it's water, food, electricity, um, or internet. And that is with Israel continuing strikes overnight, more than 750 targets hit. And of course, all of this in response to the attacks in Israel on Saturday that have left now, we understand, more than 1,300 Israelis dead um, since Saturday. And again, we step back. The goal of this wartime government, as they've explicitly said, is to crush Hamas. They have more than 300,000 soldiers positioned, ground troops near Gaza. We do not know if they intend to invade yet on the ground. We have heard from the defense forces that there has not yet been a political decision made. However, all of the ingredients are in place to move into Gaza. The military is at least preparing for this possibility. Yeah, there are a number of officials from around the world visiting today, but what are we specifically expecting from Secretary Blinken? What is he trying to achieve? Yeah, Francine, the geopolitics of this internationally are extremely, extremely complex. We have Ursula von der Leyen coming um, later today. The U.S. Defense Secretary, we understand, has arrived in Tel Aviv. We have foreign ministers coming from all over to Tel Aviv. And Blinken himself um, going to a number of different countries. So we expect from the sort of Western allies of Israel who come here to echo what Blinken said yesterday, which is a full-throated support of Israel, but also caution about how Israel goes about undertaking Hamas. What Blinken said yesterday, it's so important for, to take every possible precaution to avoid harming civilians, and that's why we mourn the losses of every single um, in, uh, innocent life. And this is all ahead of the possible uh, ground invasion. And Blinken, now we understand, is in Jordan. He will meet with Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of the Pal Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. We understand he will also go to Saudi Arabia. He will also go to Qatar, the UAE, and, you know, talk to leaders from all 
uh, from all over the regions. And this comes at a time when Hamas today has called for a day of rage across the world, protests um, across the world, which the Israeli government has warned all Jews and Israelis to stay away from. And of course, also we have the Iranian foreign minister, who we understand is currently right now in Lebanon, potentially meeting with the leadership of Hezbollah. Oliver, thank you so much. Oliver Kirk there in Tel Aviv. Of course, we'll continue watching this very closely. It's also what everyone is talking about here. The IMF World Bank meetings are taking place here in Morocco. War, of course, in the Middle East, adding to more uncertainty about the global outlook. Well, I'm now joined by Jason Furman. He's economist and professor at Harvard University, formerly a top economic advisor to uh, President Obama. Thank you for joining us, Jason. It's a week where a lot of, of people here and elsewhere, of course, are, are looking at what's happening in the Middle East what's happening between Israel and Hamas, tragic loss of human life. But could it also tip, if it becomes wider, the, the world economy into a recession? There is certainly a, a big risk here. But what's striking so far is the contrast between just the enormity of the tragedy we're seeing unfolding. And if you just looked at financial market data, I don't think you'd know anything had happened. Oil went up. A dollar since this happened. It's ten dollars off its high um, last month. Um, but you did use the right word there: uncertainty. Even if the mean doesn't change, if the variance changes, if you're less certain about the future, that can lead businesses um, to hold off. So, is this? I mean, is it almost automatically in, in inflationary, or could it be deflationary again? If there's less business spending, if consumers suddenly say, "I'm I'm really nervous about what's happening. Let me stay at home more." Right. Of course, it could go either way. Yeah. Um, if you saw a big increase in the price of oil, yes, that would be inflationary. If you don't see the increase, but you're just worried about that higher variance, not yeah. the mean changing, um, that can reduce activity. Also, fueling some of the divergences we've seen in the global economy. The U.S. will be relatively little affected, but Europe is much more serious in terms of being um, an oil importer mm -hmm. and also natural gas prices that can go up a lot more than they can in the United States. So expect this to be you know, more of a drag and a risk for the European economy than for the U.S. one, a European economy that already is facing bigger challenges. So there was a, a belief in the markets that actually the Fed may be one more hike and then done. Could, could this change the trajectory for interest rates? And if we have peak interest rates at, at a higher level, let's say six, six and a half, even seven, what does that mean for corporates? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I hate to not want to talk about the topic you want to talk about, but the run, you know, if you just care about financial markets, that run up in treasury, in treasury rates um, that led a number of Fed speakers, I think, quite wisely to say this is doing some of our work for us. We may not need to hike as much anymore. Um, that's been a big change in financial markets in the last couple of days as the Fed has internalized that message, made it clear that it understands that to markets. I used to think they were going to hike two more times. I'm not. I'm no longer sure that they're going to hike again. But so, Jesse, but we're, again, we're at this uncertainty, right? So you could have financial conditions tightening, which they have so far. You could also see a reopening with the Chinese consumer coming back, and and that would counter affect maybe some of the tightening financial conditions. Um, absolutely, and you know, you know, normally strength in China is good for the global economy, um, but it's very differential here for Europe. They're exporting a lot there, a country like Germany. So strength in China is good for them. Um, for the United States, we've probably benefited from some of the deflation in, for example, the price of oil that in part is due to weakness in China. And we'd lose that benefit if it went the other way. When you look at the world economy, what worries you the most? What worries me the most is just this combination of lots of smaller and medium-sized things and not any one thing. I mean, you always, you know, ask me any year, I'm, I'm always worried about, you know, Iran yeah. and how volatile that situation is and its place in the global economy. Certainly, you need to be more worried today than ever before, um, but I think it's that plus a lot of other things, plus the divergence. It's harder to craft a common response when China, Europe, the United States, all in really quite different situations in terms of growth, inflation, and, and overall macro trajectory. There, there's also huge divisions or splits as we go into the, the U.S. election. 
but also it was tricky f for Harvard. I don't know whether you'd describe it like that. And it, it's done the news certainly on, on Bloomberg. We had a big story saying how you or the, the university dealt with this uh, Israel-Hamas conflict. I mean, have you spent a lot of time thinking about what could have been done, what should have been done, and the role, actually, of colleges in this? Yeah, I spent a lot of time on this um, in the last week. I've spoken to a lot of Israeli and Jewish students. I've spoken to a number of Muslim students, too. And you know, there is a horrible war going on 10,000 miles away from our campus. Um, our students. You know, they all make fun of the same professors, possibly me. They all dislike the same food in the dining halls. Like, if they can't set a model for talking and engaging with each other, I don't know who can. I think part of it is that students who went out and said, basically, this is the original atrocities were not the fault of Hamas and refused to lay moral blame, set a bad tone. Um, but right now, it's degenerated. Um, the president of the university, I think, Initially, some maybe faulty communications, mm -hmm. but now I think is doing a great job of providing moral clarity, trying to bring people together. And it won't solve this problem, but maybe we can solve it a little bit better on our own, in our own little pieces of the world. Jason, thank you so much for your time today. Jason Furman, their economist and professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Now, we'll have plenty more from Karen Marrakesh coming up, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> increasing signs that a softer landing than we anticipated is possible. Uh, so there are risks to that, but there are many signs and, uh, um, and not the same in all countries. So if you look at our footprint, you know, Brazil, Mexico, 3% growth, Spain, you know, probably 1718 or so higher uh, than other European countries. U.S., incredibly resilient. And I think the good news in the U.S. is we're seeing investment by businesses. So there, there, it's different depending yep. on the countries, uh, the regions, and also the sectors. So manufacturing is suffering much more than services, for example. So again, positive signs that we might get a softer landing than anticipated. That's, that's how I would summarize it. And do you think interest rates have peaked globally? <laughs> that is the million dollar question. <laughs> so, you know, to answer the question, you need to understand and we need to remember why are we where we are. So we are where we are because we had a massive supply shock, supply side. Uh, and that is what is putting us at risk of either stagflation or a deeper recession. Central banks, I believe, are committed to staying the course. They need to get down not just inflation, but inflation expectations. The key here is that the fiscal side work alongside monetary policy. And so the fiscal policies working with businesses, we need massive investment. Massive investment means that we need to increase the supply, right? If we only keep on working on the demand side, the supply side is never going to rebalance. And so going back to the big challenge we have, the great challenge of growth, we need to make sure there's investment. Again, the U.S. is doing better than other regions. So I think that is where banks also have a role to play. You know, we have tripled our capital tripled our capital since the financial crisis. We're ready to lend. We need to make sure that governments and regulators mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. how banks are essential to rebalance the world economy. But given where interest rates are, when will depositors in Spain actually get, get more for their money? So banking is a business where you have two sides to the balance sheet, right? And so depositors, and in the case of Santander, Santander is a retail commercial bank. 80% of our depositors are retail. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those are very small transactional accounts. So there is a lot of excess liquidity. That means that we will and we are remunerating a lot of our deposits mm -hmm. already. But on the other side, because of the lack of demand, and that's an issue in Europe, you know, pricing on mortgages, we're pricing mortgages 30 basis points above the sovereign risk. So super competitive on the asset side, you know, excess liquidity, and th th that is how the market economy works, right? And so it's rebalancing. We are uh, increasing our, you know, our remuneration of deposits depending on, on the market condition and, and also the demand from customers. That was the Santander Executive Chairman, 
Anna Botin speaking to me here in Marrakesh. Coming up, we speak to Ignacio Visco, the governor of the Italy Central Bank. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Marrakesh, everyone. Now, the ECB Governing Council member, Gabriel Maclouf, says Italy's bond yield spread over peers will keep ECB officials on alert. Joining us now is Niasco Visco. He's governor of the Bank of Italy. Governor, thank you for joining us. We have a it's lot a to talk about. Italian growth, Italian bond spreads is also one of them. What do you say to, to the Irish Central Bank governor, who really sounded the alarm yesterday? <laughs> now you start immediately with uh, a kind with of beef. conflict. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't dare to talk about Ireland, but I can talk about Italy myself. And uh, I think that uh, as far as the recent uh, worries about Italian public debt, uh, they have to be understood a little bit better. Uh, first of all, the debt fell uh, 15 percentage mm -hmm. points after an increase of 20. Uh, 20 due to fight the pandemic risks, mm -hmm. which have been uh, fought uh, effectively. There has been a major rebound. The uh, reduction is uh, substantial. Uh, the issue here is whether the, in the plans of the government there mm -hmm. is further mm -hmm. the reduction or not, yeah. and mm -hmm. how and what are the constraints. Mm -hmm. My impression is that while fiscal prudence is necessary, so mm -hmm. I think that uh, for the next years, there is not, nothing we can do really to increase our fiscal space except yep. uh, a better composition of expenditures, yep. uh, we can uh, grow more. Yep. And that is the main, ma main reason why I think markets are worried, yeah. the ability of the Italian economy to grow. Yeah. But, but Governor, just because of the spread, does it change actually the way that the central bank c can also look at PEP going forwards in terms of time frame? Is it, well, we had this uh, discussion at the time of uh, f risk of fragmentation. And therefore, clearly, risk fragmentation reminds us of what happened in 2011, 2012. Uh, I don't think that we are in that realm, really. The uh, differential of the Italian um, rates with respect to the Germany is relevant, but is far from that. And uh, there are no signs, really, that it uh, mm. should rise, really, in, uh, in, in a territory yeah. uh, that, in which, which would require us to yeah. intervene. But if there was uh, a need, I think we can. Mm. Uh, it has to do with uh, this PEP being maintained. Yeah. We decided, really, to keep it until the end of this, the 2024. I think that's, that's a good, good approach, also, to somehow tranquilize the market. But I don't think that we should really have all this worry and tension okay. now. Yeah, but, Governor, what do you worry about the most? So you have a, a complicated geopolitical, of course, backdrop to a possible complicated political also backdrop in Italy. Well, I, my main worry is geopolitical. Uh, I think uh, uncertainty looms great. Um, and um, even before this uh, incredible attack by Hamas to Israel, uh, it was already uh, visible. Uh, the fragmentation, again, at the world level, the risk of uh, what somebody talks of deglobalization being um, excessively rapid, strong, and so on, I think were material. And I think that much of the benefits yeah. of being open uh, risks to be, to be lost. Yeah. But being open is not only to have a high trade of yeah. goods, services, capital, exchanges, yeah. and so on, but also open to ideas, to, in, mm -hmm. to knowledge, to, mm -hmm. to people. And in the face of a dramatic increase yeah. still in demographics, I think we have to be very careful on but, that. But, Governor, d does it change, actually, what the ECB can do? So does, do you see monetary policy having to do more if inflation picks up because of energy prices, which is now, I guess, a real possibility? The, this is a possibility that uh, energy prices, as a result of the uh, risks in the Middle East, mostly, rather than the Russian-Ukraine uh, war, uh, may 
show some uh, developments that uh, were not expected and might be on the wrong side. On the other hand, uh, I don't think that there will be the same kind of risk that we had uh, experienced when gas prices increased, because the gas prices increased from 20 uh, euros megawatt hour up to 350 yeah. and then now are yeah. at 40 so a large volatility but you know the increase was very very large that is not the picture yeah. that I have on the other hand you have to be careful my we, we are coming out also with our projections today yes. the in, in uh, for, for the Italian economy uh, and I'm not anticipating that except saying that uh, we think that the two percent target is still yeah. very much in the making yeah. Governor, you're about to step down. I have 20 seconds. What will you miss the most? Yes. What, what, what will you miss the most about these meetings? Uh, the, I'm, I'm worried here, uh, oh. really, that uh, the idea is that a closed economy can grow yeah. as if okay. it was open. Okay. Well, I'll miss our interviews, actually, once you step down. So you still have to come back on Bloomberg. Uh, governor. Uh, I may. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, of course, Ignazio Visco, the governor of Banca d'Italia. Coming up, Israel has called for an evacuation of all civilians in Gaza City. The latest on the conflict next, and this is Bloomberg. Israel's army calls for the evacuation of Gaza City within 24 hours, but the UN says the order is impossible. Iran warns Israel of a multi-front war if attacks continue. Top U.S. diplomat Antony Blinken is in Jordan as he whirlwind or his whirlwind trip continues across the Middle East. Meanwhile, Washington and Qatar agree to hold off, distributing six billion dollars in Iranian oil revenue. Plus, we're live here from the IMF World Bank meetings in Marrakesh. In just a moment, we'll be speaking to the Eurogroup President Pascal Donahoe. We'll also be speaking to Sigrid Kach very shortly. Now, good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm, of course, Francine Lacqua with more special coverage from the IMF annual meetings here in Morocco. Now, Israel has called for an evacuation of more than one million civilians living in northern Gaza within the next 24 hours, ahead of what looks like an imminent ground invasion. Let's speak to Bloomberg's Oliver Crook in Tel Aviv. So, Oli, what exactly is the latest this morning? That's right, Francine. That is the major development here. The Israeli uh, Defense Forces telling uh, the north of Gaza, Gaza City, to evacuate and to move to the south. This is displacing more than a million people, is what we're talking about. The UN says that this is virtually impossible. What the UN has said is that it's, str it's strongly appealing for any such order to be rescinded, avoiding what could transform what is already a tragedy into a calamitous situation. And the tragedy they're referring to are the already 1,500 dead, at least um, in Gaza. There were more operations overnight. Um, there is no electricity, water, food. I mean, of course, this is the response to the attacks in Israel that has left, as we understand today, more than 1,300 um, Israelis dead. There has not yet been a decision made on whether or not there will be a land invasion. However, there are 300,000 Israeli troops that are ready, that are stationed near Gaza in case they want to move forward. Now, we await Ursula von der Leyen arriving today in Israel with a number of other emissaries and Antony Blinken, as you mentioned, meeting with Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the leader of the Palestinian administrative uh, in uh, uh, the West Bank, but he will also go to Egypt. He will go to Saudi Arabia. He will go to the UAE. And you can bet absolutely top of the agenda there will be the spillover effect. Just as in Israel, all of these images of horror um, were being fed to the citizens on social media, you have the same exact phenomenon happening across the Arab world right now. You have protests today, right now, on the streets of Iraq. You have also the Iranian foreign minister um, in Lebanon right now. And we understand meeting with Hezbollah leadership. So this has huge potential for escalation. And this is going to be top of the agenda for the U.S. Secretary of State as he goes around the Middle East. Oliver, thank you so much. Uh, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook there in Tel Aviv. Now, the Netherlands heads to the polls also next month with EU debt and deficit ratios becoming surprisingly big issues for voters. Joining us now is Sigrid Kah, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance for the Netherlands. Thank you, Minister, for joining us. It's a heavy week because of the tragic loss of, of human life Correct. on both sides. And I wonder whether, as finance ministers gather here in Marrakech, a lot of the talk is actually what this also means for the world economy, for divisions in societies that are already extremely, extremely divided. No, and that's the surreal part of it. And I'm saying this also as a former humanitarian. 
Um, as the Netherlands, of course, we've strongly condemned the terror attack by Hamas uh, that resulted in the loss of innocent Israeli lives. We're also concerned uh, on the loss of the side of innocent Palestinian lives, citizens uh, in Gaza. So I think we're all deeply concerned. And yet in Marrakesh, yeah. we're talking geoeconomics, geopolitics. Yeah. So specific issues, uh, I would not say are the dominant yeah. theme, but it's in the back of everyone's mind. We'll, that we realize how uncertain the world is, that we need to invest in peace and security. We need to focus on stability, but it's very fragile in an already fragmented world. But Minister, is that because it's almost impossible actually to know where, where this goes next? What happens next? So in many uh, world stages, it is very difficult. Of course, if we uh, zoom in into uh, the particular situation now, Tel Aviv, uh, Gaza, uh, I haven't heard your report, or so I'm also not going to, to comment. But I think we're all uh, concerned. Um, we, we stand by Israel's right to self-defense, uh, equally so in line with international humanitarian law and issues of proportionality, which always have to be respected. It's a very tough call, and I'm really hopeful that Anthony Blinken will be able to uh, to speak to all, and hopefully we can uh, avert a further worsening situation. But no one can tell. Uh, would this impact uh, the geoeconomic outlook? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not entirely sure, but it reinforces a sense of insecurity, unpredictability uh, in a world where already we're slower to recover from corona, the impact of the Ukraine crisis, a war that is still going on. Uh, without prospects of an easy resolve. Uh, hence, these are the factors we have to deal with. And as you said, in the Netherlands, for instance, voters are looking at their purchasing power, um, high interest rates, uh, inflation, which is coming down, but not as low as people got used to. So these are all issues that become domestic. And ultimately, most politics is domestic, at least in a country such as the Netherlands. So it will be around security of living, uh, expenditures uh, and the investments required to make the Netherlands fit yeah. for the future. So, Minister, you, you've, you will step down. You've just said that you'll step yes. down, but actually you're staying as caretaker. Correct. Where do you see the, the politics of the Netherlands actually going from here? What will happen? Well, uh, I stepped down as a party leader and I announced I would not continue in Dutch national politics at the request of my family. Uh, I've been sort of uh, one of the most favored target of uh, extreme right wing. Now, that doesn't faze me uh, so much. I've worked and lived in war, war zones to advance peace and security. Um, but my family was deeply troubled by the dehumanization, the demonization, particularly as female political leaders. Uh, and I felt I had served my country uh, honorably for six mm -hmm. years. There's a time to come and there's a time to go and to spread your wings. But the essence is polarization. Uh, the essence is uh, extreme voices, no. uh, threats, hate, intimidation, and death threats. And that cannot be healthy to a democracy, let alone uh, for part, political parties and all of us to uphold the rule of law. It has a negative impact on society. So politicians need to continue to yeah. relate, to bridge, exude respect, but also engage in norm setting. Uh, that needs to happen in the Netherlands and it needs to happen in other European countries. What, what do you think will change that, if anything? I'm not sure. I'm hopeful that there is a new generation, there is a shift, there is a tidal wave uh, coming. And voters also have expressed, citizens are saying, enough is enough, this is not my country. Mm -hmm. I do not want to demonize the other. I want politicians and those in public service right. to deliver services for me, to render my life better and to help us build a better future in the Netherlands, with Europe, and also internationally, where we can play our part. Um, but that's a tough call, and it needs people to straighten their backs uh, and, and continue to follow their moral compass. Minister, I also need to ask about a couple of companies uh, Sorry, that, yes. of course, are on, 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 the, on the block, on the sale block, actually, yeah. for the Netherlands. What's the update on Tenet holding? Are you, are you nearing the sale? <laughs> oh, that would be an unwise uh, uh, reflection of mine at all. The negotiations are ongoing. Is there anything else? I mean, one of the other things is, you know, you have been cutting the stake, or the Dutch government has been cutting the stake of ABN AMRO. What do, what's the ideal way of, of moving this forward? Well, again, there we don't comment publicly on what the sort of the positioning is. We have indeed cut out the, 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 st the share of the state mm -hmm. to below the 50 percent. That was always the target. It hadn't achieved for a long time. Uh, but that we do in sort of the confidentiality mm -hmm. and in line with sort of market uh, regulations that we have. What will you do next? I don't know. 
and that's sort of uh, interesting and exciting. I certainly want to uh, be out there internationally again. Mm -hmm. I've always had an international outlook and experience, and um, I'm hopeful and interested to see what may come my way. And if it doesn't, something else I'll have to create. Is it daunting at all, or is? Um, n yes and no. I mean, I've I have 35 years of work experience, so I should have the comfort of that. And it's always daunting to start something new, but I've often done that. Different roles, different countries, different organizations or assignments. So I'm also actually sort of looking forward to the unknown. I just hope it's going to be safe and good. Me too. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sigrid Kach, there, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of the Netherlands. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, right here from the IMF World Bank meetings, the IMF cutting growth forecast to the euro area, warning of stubborn inflation and weak global growth in 2024. We'll discuss much more of that with the Eurogroup president, Pascal Donoghue. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and European Parliament President Roberta Metsola will visit Israel today to meet with the country's leaders. Now, this, of course, in the week that the IMF cut its growth forecast for the euro area, warning of a stubborn inflation and weak global growth in 2024. Now, we're pleased to be joined by the Eurogroup President Pascal Donahue. Pascal, as always, thank you so much for joining us. It's a tough week because we look at geopolitics and it's not really filtering through a lot of the conversations here because that's focused on the macroeconomy. And frankly, is it just impossible to, to say what risks we'll be facing b because of the renewed conflict? Indeed, and the uh, recent tragic events in the Middle East remind us of the era that we are in, of unpredictable historic events taking place that can change so quickly the economic context that we're in. And while, of course, we're here appropriate, appropriately talking about economics yeah. and what it means for jobs and income, yeah. of course, I'm so conscious of the suffering, yeah. the lives lost and the great trauma that many are enduring at the moment, uh, both in the Middle East and, of course, Ukraine. But we are indeed in an era of unpredictability, uh, which makes economic choices all the more important. But what does that mean for possible volatility? Again, we don't know what happens with this conflict. Um, yeah. This is after also a number of shocks because of what's happening in Ukraine, because of COVID. Yeah. So how difficult is it even to set policy? Well, I continue to be positive about the ability of the euro area and the European Union uh, to be stable and to be resilient mm -hmm. in an atmosphere where the frequency of shocks and their impact very much appears to be in line uh, with other historical periods mm -hmm. where very big events happened with great frequency with unpredictable consequences. Uh, but if I look at how we have navigated our way through the pandemic and if I look at the continued employment resilience of the euro area, um, I am I'm not at all complacent, uh, but I still believe the foundations are in place for us to be stable within the euro area and to, for us to respond to these challenges. But of course, the most important uh, economic issue will be what, in fact, the latest developments have on inflation. But do, do you think the euro area can actually avoid a recession? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. I think the most likely scenario at the moment is still one of lower growth. As you correctly identified a moment ago, the IMF have changed the growth outlook for the euro area. Uh, that change in the growth outlook for me is very uh, understandable in the context of the scale of conflict mm -hmm. that is taking place within Europe at the moment. But even with that change in the growth forecast, it's still a forecast of growth. Mm -hmm. And critically, from a social cohesion perspective, mm -hmm. we're still seeing very high levels of employment. Oh. And I think that is... Um, a vital political mm -hmm. factor in dealing with all of these challenges. I think Janet Yellen, Secretary Yellen, is actually coming to the Euro area. Yes, we are. Meetings on Monday. She is what, indeed. What will you discuss? Well, we're very much looking forward to welcoming Secretary Yellen to the Euro group. Uh, this, we have now made this nearly an annual event where we invite the Secretary to meet all ministers collectively. And the themes of our discussion will be our shared efforts with regard to inflation, mm -hmm. our cooperation now with regard to Ukraine and the importance of that. And then, of course, there'll be many other economic issues that will be discussed, including the interplay between the Inflation Reduction Act and the various uh, national recovery and reform mm -hmm. plans that are underway within the European Union 
in the aftermath of COVID, which of course is funded by a new form of public debt. I was going to ask you about the Inflation Reduction mm -hmm. Act. A lot of people were angry that the U.S. were putting such a thing in place. Is, is there going to be a, a more robust European response? Well, there's been a lot of robust European discussion uh, in relation to us. Mm -hmm. And for me, the response is what we're already doing, uh, which mm -hmm. is the implementation of the uh, uh, recovery plans that were put in place in the aftermath of the pandemic. That involves spending hundreds of billions of euros in the kind of sectors that Europe and America have now identified to be really, really important. And then we're also looking at some very limited changes within the single market framework to help particular countries and all countries still be competitive. And I think that's the space that we should be in. I mean, the good thing is, at least we're all looking at the parts of our economy, the green parts of our economy and the digital parts of our economy that have the potential to deliver public goods in the future. There, critics say that the new 2024 Irish budget will fuel inflation. Would you respond to them? So if you look at the 2024 budget, which we did just did on Tuesday, so it's been a busy week, uh, that actually is looking to reduce the fiscal stimulus in our economy mm -hmm. across next year. We did our budget a year ago, and then we added mm -hmm. to that budget with many other economic decisions that we took within this year. Um, and we're looking to move away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've reduced the value of our subsidies uh, to, um, to households and to businesses by between a quarter and a fifth. And uh, if we now deliver these spending plans next year, which the government will no. do, it will reduce by quite a bit the degree of fiscal stimulus right. within our economy. Uh, now, is there an inflation risk? Yep. The truth is there is risks everywhere at right. the moment. Right. But if we didn't act, there's also a risk of many, many households in Ireland becoming a lot poorer. And it's about trying to get that balance right, yep. which I believe we have. But we're reducing but our supports. Yeah, Minister, how, how difficult actually is it to get that balance right across the euro area? Yeah. Because it's it's also you know, swelling debt, but at the same time you still have to, you know, in a lot of parts take care of the most vulnerable. It's so. a real balance and a balance that we have to attain. Within Ireland it has a very different context uh, because we have a budget surplus in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move in 2024 into a third year of running quite a significant surplus. So, of course, that makes it a very difficult, uh, even it's, very different political yeah, discussion yeah, because the yeah. money is there to spend. Yeah. And we are deciding not yeah. to spend that surplus because we yeah. don't want to add to inflation. In relation to your further point there about the euro area, um, this is why we are saying that we shouldn't be withdrawing subsidies entirely or withdrawing energy support plans entirely. But we need to work a bit harder to give the support to those who need it the most. But that's not easy uh, because no. even technically it yeah. can be very hard to do uh, to come up with the programs that can make that happen. How much do you worry about the commercial uh, property sector? Well, if I, look at, if I look at it within Ireland, uh, the commercial real estate risks that we have are no different to any other country uh, that has a big capital city within us, that has a lot of big employers in us. I think it is a risk. What I think is more likely to happen, though, is I think we're likely to see a very different use okay. of commercial uh, property in the years ahead. I think it's going to move away from us all sitting beside each other, looking at computer screens, not talking to each other, into more creative and meeting areas. That, that will be Maybe that's welcome. a slight that's note a, of optimism to end <laughs> that there. Will be welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Pascal Donahue there, the president of the Eurogroup. We'll have plenty more, of course, from Marrakesh. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Pulse. I'm Kriti Gupta in London. Microsoft's $69 billion takeover of Activision Blizzard has been approved by the UK competition watchdog. The CMA says that Microsoft's restructured offer to sell some gaming rights to French publisher Ubisoft satisfied the competition concerns it had. Let's bring in the CEO of the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Sarah Cardell joins me live on the program. Sarah, congratulations to you and to your team for finally getting this across the finish line. What struck out to me in your announcement this morning is that you still had limited residual concerns around pieces of the deal. Can you elaborate on that? So in our previous consultation that we put out a couple of weeks ago, uh, we made clear that the deal had resolved the substantial concerns that we had previously. And that's because Microsoft have brought forward this 
this fundamental concession, this fundamental restructure of the deal, which now puts all of the cloud streaming rights in relation to Activision's games content, all of the games that are available now, but also any content that's created over the next 15 years. And those rights are put in the hands of Ubisoft, an independent competitor. And that breaks the stranglehold that we were concerned Microsoft would have over this important cloud gaming sector as it develops and emerges. Now, we had some residual concerns at the time just to make sure that the terms of that arrangement with Ubisoft were absolutely watertight. We had a short consultation, yeah. and as a result of that, we've satisfied ourselves that those concerns are resolved, and therefore, this new restructured deal is clear to proceed today. A sigh of relief, I'm sure, on the Microsoft side, as well as for a lot of tech companies broadly. Sarah, while I have you, though, I'm curious about how some of this uh, experience applies to some of the other tech deals that are on your docket. I'm looking at, for example, the Adobe Figma merger, which is under quite a bit of scrutiny as well, not just from you, but from your peers around the world as well, in addition to the latest probe that I believe Ofcom recommended to the CMA when it comes to cloud computing in, in the country. Walk us through the updates on those two investigations? So those investigations are both live. As you say, the Adobe Figma investigation is, is sort of fairly well uh, evolved through our process, but that's being investigated by an independent group as the case with all of our phase two merger investigations. Uh, so it's not really appropriate for me to comment further on that deal at this stage. Uh, likewise, our new investigation into cloud infrastructure services has just started. Uh, this is an important investigation, uh, but it's running to an 18-month timetable, so it'll be some time before we come through with our initial views on that. But what I would say is a common theme through all of this work is that the CMA has a real responsibility to make sure that all of these digital markets are open, are running effective competition in conditions where choice and innovation can really thrive, where new competitors are able to come into the market and grow. And that is important because yeah. it benefits both consumers and businesses who are trying to compete in those markets. So that is a responsibility that we have, whatever deal we're looking at. Uh, and, and we take that responsibility I'm very seriously. I'm glad to hear you say that. And, and very quickly, Sarah, some of your critics have compared the CMA to how the European Commission operates, saying that perhaps the CMA is more rigid and less willing to negotiate and work with the authorities as opposed to, say, the European Commission or arguably even the American authorities as well. What would you say to that? Is this going to change your approach to those mergers? We have about 40 seconds left. So we've been really clear that it's for the parties to resolve our concerns. Microsoft eventually came forward with a major concession that was a real game changer, but they took far too long to do that. So my message is, if parties want to resolve their concerns, come forward quickly and fully in an effort to do that, and then we will engage constructively in those discussions. And you'll engage from the beginning. Is that right, Sarah, yes or no? Well, the sooner they come forward, the sooner we can engage, but it needs to be a genuine, sincere attempt to resolve our concerns. Understood. Sarah Cardell, the CEO of the Competition Markets Authority, we thank you so much for joining us this morning. Plenty more to bring you from the IMF as well, including an exclusive interview with Unicredit Chairman Pietro Carlo Padoan coming up just after 10.10 10 a.m. London time. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.